uh, it's uh, these are in in person events, uh, but uh, they are each one being uh, recorded, being filmed. And so the intention is that the Lion Court's uh, YouTube channel uh, will be updated with films of all the lectures. And so we hope that it will be um, uh, an entertaining and informative resource when next you decide to visit uh, the, Lion, the Lion Court website. At the, at the moment, they're not all up. Um, so please give give us time to get all the all the films uh, in in place. Now, let me just click there. Um, so uh, so nothing nothing very uh, original for me about spotting uh, 1672. Um, but please, I'm sure you'll give me credit for the fact that I realised, of course, who could forget it being a McPherson that 1672 is hugely significant in terms of our uh, clan history because 1672, the year in which Duncan McPherson of Clooney casting, casting off his, his uh, any sense of, of dependence upon uh, the Laird of Macintosh uh, applied to the Lord Lyon for uh, his ancient coat of arms as the only uh, true representative of uh, the clan Chatton, and uh, I'll be I'll be telling you much about the uh, the controversy, uh, the controversy about that. But in the meantime, uh, let's just be a little, a little bit playful and think about um, anniversaries. I've mentioned the uh, clan association 75th. We've mentioned the public register of all arms and bearings 350th. But in just three years' time, uh, we shall have the 600th anniversary of what um, uh, Alexander Bain in his lecture on the chiefship of Clan Chatton, he was speaking in Inverness in 1895, pointed out to be the first appearance of the word clan in what he termed English literature. And that's in 1425 in Winton's Chronicle. Winton's Chronicle, this Andrew of Winton, the original chronicle of Scotland. And I'm talking about uh, the account of the battle late September 1396 at the North Inch of Perth, the battle, the battle of the clans. And we know lots about uh, that particular battle, of course, that there were three score wild Scottish men who were fighting, 30 on each side, 30 for 30. Um, uh, we know how much was spent on building the uh, the stockade, the lists, the pavilion in which King Robert III uh, um, was seated to view the sanguinary uh, battle uh, that was to take place between these selected representatives of clans. And we know from Winton's Chronicle that the clans were called Clan Quail and Clan Clachinia. Um, what we don't really know for certain is exactly what the two clans were, but uh, we don't really need to worry about that too much because Sir Walter Scott um, has given uh, the clan Chatton and the McPhersons etern eternal, eternal, eternal uh, publicity, uh, publicity um, as being, as the, being clan the clan that was um, one of the two. And reading from uh, the Fair Maid of Perth, um, this is this is when it's realized that the clan Chatton have turned up for battle and they are one man short. Uh, the chief of clan Chatton replied, you have judged impartially and nobly, my lords, and I deem myself obliged to follow your direction. So make proclamation, heralds, that if anyone will take his share with clan Chatton of the honors and chances of this day, he shall have present payment of a gold crown and liberty to fight to the death in my ranks. The heralds had made their progress, moving halfway round the lists, stopping from time to time to make proclamation as they had been directed without the least apparent disposition on the part of anyone to accept the proffered enlistment. Some sneered at the poverty of the Highlanders who set so mean a price upon such a desperate service. Others affected resentment that they should esteem the blood of citizens so lightly. None showed the slightest intention to undertake the task proposed until the sound of the proclamation reached Henry of the Wind. Here am I, Sir Herald, Henry of the Wind, 
willing to do battle against the clan whale. Um, well, stirring, stirring stuff, and I read that because isn't that uh, in the world of literature, proof enough of 1396 and the romance of that story as the first time that our, our uh, predecessors in the clan uh, encountered the heralds of Scotland. Um, and um, uh, if I show you my second slide, you'll you realize, you realize why you'll realize why it's important to give emphasis to the functions of the heralds and the perseverance, um, because there is a scene in Westminster Abbey on Monday of this very week, uh, the uh, officers of arms of Scotland at the head of that particular procession, followed by the heralds and perseverance of England. I suppose the officers of arms have never had quite such a large worldwide audience ever before. I wonder if perhaps if you can spot my head, I'm the, uh, in the left-hand file, the second man from uh, the front. Uh, so rather, rather playfully, I allow uh, Sir, Walter, Sir Walter Scott to uh, get the Macphersons to the subject of dealing with heralds and heraldry. And uh, indeed, it's appropriate to uh, function on uh, heralds because heralds existed before what we now understand to be heraldry. Heraldry, a, a, a systematic and hereditary system for the, the uh, inheritance of ensigns armorial, um, but heraldry as such as a, as a, as a, uh, a science um, developed after uh, the heralds were in place and the first tasks of the heralds of old we know were acting as messengers uh, delivering the king's messages abroad and indeed throughout throughout the uh, country, and as acting as um, stewards, as it were, uh, at uh, tournaments. Uh, so it's um, uh, appropriate that I just mention that that significance. And 1425, as uh, Alexander McBain point pointed out, first mention of the word clan. I could also mention uh, the following year, 1426, which is the First, the year of a reference to the office of unicorn pursuivant of arms. So the 600th anniversary for that is, is also coming up in just a few years. And uh, uh, I hope, I hope um, uh, DV that I will continue to be in office at that, at that time. I, I uh, have a, a commission until I reach the age of 70. I, so I may, be, I may be called upon to host a very large party for the 600th anniversary of Unicorn First, first One. If, if we have such a party, let's do it on Zoom so you can, you can, all, uh, you can all join in. And I'm not sure that I could stretch to uh, uh, the, the pervy, as we would say in Glasgow, meaning the feeding, the feeding of the 500 um, for, um, for such, a, for such a, an, an occasion. Um, now, in mentioning... Um, uh, the Scots officers of arms, um, I, I find myself in the position of being the first Scottish officer of arms by the name of Macpherson. But the fact, of course, is I'm very conscious of, uh, as it were, in what I might, I might call my, my uh, heraldic career, uh, to be aspiring to follow in the footsteps of the great Gordon Macpherson, uh, Niagara Herald Extraordinary of Canada. And, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with Gordon, it's the case he's been drawing coats of arms for as long as the Clan Macpherson Association has been in, in, in existence. 1946, I believe, was the start. I was looking back through back numbers of Craig Dew and seeing articles by um, uh, almost my namesake, Roderick Gordon Murdoch McPherson uh, in the 1950s and his clan armorial in the, from the 1960s onwards was the way in which those of us who, who got to see uh, the clan magazine learned about uh, heraldry. And it, indeed, whenever, whenever uh, I see uh, uh, a McPherson shield, I'm always looking to see whether I can recognize 
uh, the beautiful the beautiful artistry of Gordon McPherson. Um, so from the um, from the uh, back numbers of Craig Dew, <clears throat> this is the 2005 edition. A very very important um, article that uh, Gordon McPherson contributed to the Clan Armorial, drawing our attention to the earliest version of what could be recognized as being the Clooney arms, and this from um, an armorial, sometimes called the workman armorial or the foreman armorial, uh, usually the foreman workman um, armorial, one of the, uh, the, second, the second oldest, in fact, of the Scots um, uh, uh, heraldic uh, manuscripts, uh, and uh, hugely important, um, because it dates from the reign of um, Mary Queen of Scots. Um, uh, and I'm not going to go into a digression about where I am sitting, but my, my, home, my home is in the Langside district of Glasgow, and it was, it was here, and my, my house was built in the Victorian era on the battlefield of Langside, where Mary Stuart's fate uh, was sealed. Uh, in 1568, and having, having escaped from Loch Leven, she uh, found herself fleeing to England from uh, Langside uh, to her uh, imprisonment and eventual ex execution. Um, so the, the, this armorial, a line drawing from which is on the screen and brought to our attention by Gordon uh, McPherson in 2005, uh, is of uh, very great uh, historic importance. Now, um, you'll, you'll immediately focus on the ways in which it's different from what we recognize to be in Clooney's shield. There's that, that uh, a flaming torcher at the, uh, uh, atop the, uh, the mast, and there seems to be either a very large fish um, or, uh, or, or some uh, aquatic monster um, uh, lurking underneath the limpet or uh, galley uh, that's, that's on the, uh, that's the main, the main charge. On the, um, on the shield. Um, Gordon McPherson absolutely correctly says that when you see the colors, the colors match the, uh, the tinctures and the metals of the shield that we know and recognize to this day as, um, as Clooney's shield. And uh, uh, you can see the, um, uh, the dagger uh, being held in the, uh, right, the, the right hand and you can see the Lamfred or galley. And those of you who are familiar with um, uh, great uh, um, authoritative work, um, Alexander Nidsmith's system of heraldry, uh, will know that the description that Nisbet gives, uh, this is a book published in 1722, but it was, it was a work completed uh, a good many years before then. Um, in talking about the Macpherson's shield. It says that the, the uh, emblem of the McPherson's is the galley. And then he goes into the account of what uh, uh, Tacitus tells us about the Catai, and he talks about the Catai tribe being forced by Tiberius Caesar to leave their own land in Germany, and they embarked for Britain, and because of the severity of the weather, they were driven to the north of Scotland. And uh, there was a, a tradition uh, that connected the galley, the Lamphad or galley that you can see on the screen with the fact that the Catai uh, were the clan Chatton uh, in origin uh, and that the boat um, commemorated that voyage, uh, even to the extent that a huge table um, was located at Ravelston House. Ravelston House, a uh, uh, um, uh, property of the, uh, the Keiths. And in that house until, recorded until 1926, this mighty table called the Black Stock of Clanchatton, a table that was believed to have been constructed from the very timbers of the boat in which the Clan Catai had traveled from Germany uh, to Scotland. Uh, now, I mentioned this just to point out the fact that there was such a tradition. 
uh, but the dating of the manuscript, this um, Workman Foreman manuscript, is very important to us because we can really say it predates uh, the uh, tradition of the Katai. Uh, and that's, that's because we can, we can pinpoint pretty clearly where the tradition of this German tribe that was mentioned in Tacitus being connected with Clanchatton and connected with uh, the Macphersons comes from. And it, it comes from George Keith, the great Earl Marshall, um, whose, oration, whose uh, funeral in 1623 was the occasion for a very learned oration by the professor of moral philosophy at Marshall College in Aberdeen, which had been founded by this great nobleman, the Earl Marshall in 1593. And it explained that the Earl Marshall had, through his careful researches of all the, uh, 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 the known sources of information, had been able to elucidate the fact that the, uh, uh, the Catai and the Clan Chatton were as one, and that the, uh, the, the great noblemen, uh, the, uh, the Earl Marshals and the Knight Marshals of Scotland, were also members of that, of that uh, tribe. Uh, the beauty of this um, armorial manuscript is that we can see it predates the time when uh, uh, the Earl Marshal was, uh, was the Earl Marshal by, well, he succeeded in 1581. And this um, uh, armorial, I think, can be dated pretty, pretty uh, well, conservatively to 1565, about 1565, late in the reign of Mary Stuart. Um, so we can really, I think, be pretty sure that the emblem, the central central uh, charge in the, uh, the Clooney arms um, uh, relates to uh, dependency of old on the Lords of the Isles, it may be a version of the galley of Lorne. It's not the boat which brought the cat eye to Scotland because, frankly, it's very unlikely that that legend is true. I'm being polite about it. It's a, it's, it's a, lovely, it's a lovely legend, and I'll, I'll tell you little bits, bits about it because uh, uh, in the same way as reading Sir Walter Scott, he, he's made it real because it's entered literature. And so the... Uh, uh, the, uh, there's some literary truth in the origins of Dunchatton in, in the cat's eye, but not, not, histor not historical truth um, at all. Uh, and uh, here, here, we, here we are. What I, want, what I wanted to say at this point, uh, the gentleman you recognize on the right, James Brodie Macpherson of Clooney, uh, the fifth Clooney of my lifetime, and I think you have to be 90 and over to uh, remember six, six uh, Clooney's and long, long may, long may Clooney, Clooney uh, reign. Uh, and on his left, uh, uh, talking of reigns, the reigning king of arms, Dr. Joseph Morrow, my, my boss. And there, there uh, he was uh, with Clooney visiting the, uh, the museum shortly after its reopening. And behind, of course, the wall, the uh, Gordon McPherson's great gift uh, to the clan, the, the painted shields of all the armagers within the, uh, the clan uh, McPherson. Um, again, more, more praises to be heaped on uh, Niagara Herald. Extraordinary. And there is uh, the wall. And let's just have a little close up, please, because we are talking after all about the controversy of uh, Clooney's, Clooney's uh, shield. Um, now, uh, in terms of the material that I'm, I'm sharing with you, um, I've, I've got some, uh, uh, some things I hope you will enjoy very much um, by having access to Lion Court uh, records. I'm able to show you photographs of the, uh, the uh, Mary, Mary Queen of Scots Armorial that I've been telling you um, about, uh, and a few other um, armorials which are held in the Lion office. And I also want to make a, a give my big thank you to 
uh, Guy McPherson Grant of Ballandalach, who very, very kindly gave me uh, access to his archives to uh, allow me to study this document, um, the genealogy of the McPhersons, commonly called the Clan Chatton, 1705. Uh, now, I had hoped that this might have been uh, an 18th century uh, version of the uh, genealogies of the Clan McPherson since the Three Brethren, which is, uh, we have it on the, uh, the clan's website uh, through the wonderful work of, uh, of making a typescript from the manuscript of the so-called Indrishi book. Um, the first 100, 104 pages given over to a transcript of a transcript of what is Sir Aeneas McPherson of Indrishi's wonderful genealogy of the clan. And um, I haven't been able to find an, an 18th century copy uh, of that work, but I'm so grateful to uh, the Clan Association for making available the, uh, the, type, the typescript based upon that um, Edwardian, Edwardian uh, um, work of penmanship uh, completed by the Ballandalich uh, family. Uh, anyway, the, what, what I found is this 1705 work to be was uh, six, six pages of a history uh, giving an account of uh, the Katai in Germany. So that, uh, that bit of uh, the legend, um, which uh, struck me, I thought, is this a reworking of the material that uh, Sir Aeneas McPherson gave to Jeremy Collier for the great uh, dictionary, which was published in 1701, and you can read uh, the extract from the dictionary as one of the first items in our own Clan, Clan McPherson um, uh, online version of the Inverishi book. Um, but uh, I couldn't find I couldn't find the exactly the same words being used in the six pages of closely written uh, manuscript, but I did find. Some of the phrases, exactly the ones that we find in the Loyal Dissuasive, uh, Sir Aeneas's memorial that he wrote in 1701 to his chief, uh, Duncan McPherson of Cluny. Uh, and let me just say, I'm in no doubt that what this is, is uh, a work of Sir Aeneas McPherson. I can't find any trace of it ever having been published um, before. Uh, I hope if I further bit of study, if I can find some uh, holograph of uh, Sir Linnaeus beyond the signatures that I've seen by him, I hope it might be that it's in his very manuscript, uh, his very own handwriting. But at, at the moment, um, I'm sure it is his work uh, and I can't vouch for who the scribe may have been. Um, but uh, much to my pleasure, um, although I didn't find the genealogy, the detailed genealogy, fabulous genealogy that I was hoping for, I did find some mention of the uh, controversy of 1672 about Cl Cluny's shield. And so I'm able uh, in the talk tonight to give you some, some new comments on, uh, 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 on the controversy. Um, now, um, just to give you a, a flavor, a flavor of this uh, Ballandalich um, uh, man, man, manuscript, um, I'll read, read something which has a bearing on heraldry. It starts with all the old, uh, I'm, I'm uh, saving all honor to the great Earl Marshal nonsense about the clan, the, the cat eye of uh, uh, Germany. Um, but I'll read you just a little bit, which uh, will lead up to uh, Sir George Mackenzie of Rosehawk, the Lord Advocate during the reign of Charles II, and the first published author on Scots heraldry. So that's where I'll, I'm starting from, and that's where I'll get to. So reading, reading from the manuscript, Kenneth II, being a brave and warlike prince, uh, he uh, uh, asks Gilly Chatton Moore 
uh, to send one of his two sons called Robert, some say the eldest, some say the second, with the better half of his family to join his lawful sovereign, King Kenneth II. At the arrival of the clan Chatton, this is where they're doing battle against, the, the Scots are doing battle against the Picts. At the arrival of clan Chatton, Robert observing that Juris Canus, King of Picts, made more havoc among the Scots, routed that body of the Picts and killed Duris Canus with his own hand. His son, Gile Chatton Oig, who was likewise there and a brave, valorous young gentleman, pursued his father's victory with a great deal of good success, broke and routed the main body of the Pictish army, cut off Duricanus's hand and brought it over to the king, his master. And after the chase was over and the Scots left masters of the field, the king, being solicitous to know to whom he owed so signal and unexpected a victory, was told that it was under guards to the Clanchatton and their valiant leader. Whereupon the king called for Gile Chatton Oig, desired that he might bring Duris Canis's head along with him, which Gile Chatton, holding in his hand, the king turning it to and again that he might better espy it, besmeared his fingers with its blood and endeavoring to clean them on Gilichatton's shield, left three strokes of blood upon it, which the king ordered to be his Gilichatton's bearing, and the achievement of his posterity to perpetuate the memory of so great an action, and then and there created him Knight Marshal of Scotland, of whom the Earl Marshal and the illustrious family of Keiths are linearly descended, and give the same achievement by the name of three pallets to this very day. And here is the coat of arms. Uh, this is from the armorial of uh, Sir David Lindsay of the Mount. This is the oldest uh, of our Scots um, uh, armorials. Keith, the Earl Marshal, the three pallets, the supposedly three finger strokes, strokes uh, put on Gilly Chatton Oig's shield. Well, uh, this is, this is legend uh, and uh, 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 fiction, uh, but this, this is, uh, when we get to uh, Sir George Mackenzie's, the first published book on Scots heraldry in 1680, you see this becomes really quite concrete and a matter of antiquarian uh, interest, definitely. And it, you will see that the red hand holding the dagger which we have in Clooney's shield to this day, and the three pallets, supposedly the three finger strokes from, uh, the, uh, from Kenneth II, King of Scots, upon the shield of Gilly Chatton uh, Oig, uh, end up being mentioned amazingly in one same sentence of Sir George Mackenzie's famous work. And so the ordinarily colors are not only preferable as they, best, as they suit best with what is represented. As for instance, in the Keith arms, three pails, three pails, it's the same as pallets, three pails, gules, being to represent three bloody drafts drawn by the king, and a hand gules in the Macpherson arms for killing the coming, could not have been so honorably represented by any other color. Yet if the bearing require no special color, it is given as a rule that the shield should be of a nobler color than the bearing. And so it goes on. But here's actually uh, the redness that features in the uh, shield of Macpherson of Clooney uh, fits in with this um, antiquarian uh, uh, fiction about the, um, about the clan, uh, the Catai and the clan Chatton of old. So there we are, a little, a little uh, digression but a nice, a nice gift from uh, Guy McPherson Grant's uh, manuscript, and not the last one that I shall, that I shall mention. Now, uh, to 1672 and the great controversy. I mentioned that uh, Duncan McPherson of Clooney decided to throw off all sense of dependence upon Macintosh, and he went to, uh, he, Duncan of Clooney, went to Edinburgh, and he asked, to matriculate um, uh, his, ancient, his ancient arms. Uh, and he was given um, uh, uh, arms, uh, 
and ancient arms of Clan Chatton at, at that, um, which I shall be able to explain to you by showing you uh, Lion Court, Lion Court um, documents. Um, and in fact, let me just read from that 1705 Ballandalach uh, manus manuscript. Um, and I'll say, the Laird of Clooney Macpherson took out the ancient achievement of his family as chief of the Macphersons and some others called the old Clan Chatton. The ancient achievement. So it was, it was believed in 1672 that there was an ancient shield that could be claimed by the chief of Clan Chatton. And let me first, first of all, draw, draw to your attention this this armorial, which is in the Lion, the Lion office, is called Pont's Manuscript, James Pont. It's dated, uh, uh, well, the date I've seen is 1624. So um, it uh, predates 1672. That's the, that's the important thing. Uh, you can see here it mentions Macpherson, P-H-E-A-R-S-O-N is, uh, is the spelling. Um, but I particularly draw your attention, go one, two, three, four, five names up, and you'll see Macintosh. He almost forgets the T in Macintosh. Can you see? And the reading is Macintosh as the chief of the clan Chatton. Now, just just uh, ponder ponder on that. There was a book um, uh, accessible, uh, we suppose, to the Lion Office in 1672, which showed Macintosh as the chief of Clan Chatton. Uh, in terms of um, uh, a shield and crest. Uh, that seems significant. And I've been emphasizing uh, the Foreman Workman Armorial, showing you the galley, showing you the dagger in the hand, showing you the cross, crosslet, crosslet at Fitche. But this is a poor photograph uh, of an impression of the earliest Macpherson shield we know of. And this is from the early part of the 16th century, one Macpherson of Bryn. And uh, you maybe just have to take my word for it. It's a lion rampant. It is not a galley. It is not a hand holding a dagger. It is not a cross crosslet. Uh, Fitche, uh, a lion rampant. And if you're familiar with the arms of Macintosh, you know, in the first, first quarter of the Macintosh arms is a lion rampant because of the tradition of descent from the, uh, the Earl of Fife. Now, um, here is the glorious, glorious page from the uh, Inglorious Technicolor of uh, the workman, foreman, uh, manuscript, and there you can see, I showed you Gordon McPherson's line drawing before without the colour. Here it is in colour on folio uh, 102 of that important uh, armorial. Um, I call to your attention the, the, the fact that the sea is definitely blue. Uh, the the uh, upper part is, uh, is gold. Uh, the charges are red for the dagger and the hand and for the cross. And I would say the galley could, could be gold. It's not very shiny gold, but I'm, I'm prepared to accept that it's, that it's gold. And let me show you my, my close-up photograph that I, that I took um, uh, of, the, of the shield. Uh, well, first of all, I draw your attention to the fact that above the shield, there's been the equivalent of uh, 16th, 17th, 18th century tipex. And you see there's white paint above the shield. The lettering, I'm sure, is very old. And I'm, I'm perfectly prepared to accept its 17th century lettering. Um, uh, Glan. Hattons, Glan Hattons of old, or Macpherson's with an F coat. There's maybe a, an, an, an ampersand for an etc. possibly, 
Um, but I think you, you can see a, a swipe of the pen. Um, something has been written has been written underneath. I don't know what it is. I would also say that in writing Van Hatten of old, uh, the D uh, the D of old appears to have gone beyond the paper on the original part of the the really old piece of the paper. Um, so uh, interesting detective work still still to be done on what it might possibly say uh, un underneath. But how. Wonderful to see there um, the shield, so much uh, Clooney's own uh, shield, uh, and it is styled Clan Chatton of old, or Macpherson's coat. And Gordon Macpherson wondered if perhaps the scoring out of Macpherson's could reflect what went on in 1672. So to our tale, on the 12th of March, 1672, uh, Clooney asks for a matriculation and receives a matriculation really of these arms as the, uh, the chief, the only representative, and therefore the, the true representative from the chief of, of Clan, Clan Chatton. And he goes back to, uh, to the Highlands, very, very pleased that he has uh, been so recognized. And by uh, July, Macintosh comes to know what has happened, and he goes to the Lord Lion and seeks to have the um, uh, seeks to have uh, the matriculation to Clooney rescinded, in which uh, he is he is successful uh, in so in so doing. And uh, let me um, let me read to you the the words as they appear as they appear on the. Um, uh, uh, in the Inverishi book, available available online. Um, uh, this, here we are, uh, and here you are to know. And this is this is Sir Aeneas Macpherson's genealogy of the three uh, of of the Macpherson since the three brethren. And here you are to know that how soon Macintosh got intelligence that Clooney, his own pretended kinsman, had not only got in coat of arms as the only representative of the old Dunchatton but also had got letters of relief against his kindred, for whom he did secure to the council immediately. Mackintosh went to Edinburgh, and by bribing of the Lion Herald, got from him in declaration, the double whereof is set here down. The words are, We, Sir Charles Erskine of Cambo, Knight Baronet, Lord Lyon, Having perused and seen sufficient evidence and testimonies from history, our own registers and bonds of manrent, do hereby declare that we find the Laird of Macintosh to be the only undoubted chief of the name of Macfers of, of I beg your pardon, of Macintosh, and to be the chief of the Clan Chatton, comprehending the Macphersons, McGillivrays, Parkinsons, McQueens, McBeans, MacPhails, and others and that we have not given and will give none of these families any arms, but as cadets of the Laird of Macintosh's family, whose predecessor married the Hertex of Clanchatton in Anno 1291. And that in particular, we declare that we have given Duncan Macpherson of Clooney a coat of arms as a cadet of the aforesaid family, and that this may remain to posterity and may be known to all concerned whether of the four set names or others, we have subscribed these presents with our own hand at Edinburgh, the 20th day of August, 1672. And, um, uh, well, this is, this, is very, this is very interesting stuff because um, when we're talking about this controversy of 1672, I particularly draw your attention to uh, Innes of Learney's book, on the tartans and clans and families of Scotland, uh, been uh, very easily available since 19, 1938. And we can really see that Thomas Innes of Learney, who was then a herald, he was later to become the uh, well-known famous as the Lord Lion, he really uh, developed so much of his concept of the power of lion in relation to clans honorable community of clans. He really developed it by studying the controversy over Clooney's, Clooney's shield. And uh, he makes much of this uh, clan 
Chatton Declaration of, 15, of 1672, uh, it's rather interesting that the version he quotes, which is from the Macintosh uh, muniments, uh, has uh, some little differences. Uh, the Lord Lyon refers to himself uh, by the first person singular, whereas Sir Aeneas uh, gives us the more usual um, regal uh, we. Um, and the version that uh, Ennis of Learney quotes gives the date of the 10th day of September, not the 20th day of August, 1672. I can't quite explain why the dates should be different. Uh, perhaps it's sort of a miscopying by uh, Sir Aeneas. He, he did make mistakes from time to time. On the other hand, please remember the significance of the 10th of September, 1672, because that was the day on which was passed the uh, Lord Lyon Act of 1672, which is the one that we've been celebrating, as I said, the 350th anniversary, which instituted uh, the, uh, which instituted the uh, public register of all arms and uh, bearings. Um, but I must hasten on to show you the uh, next, next slide. Um, uh, this, by the way, is the first page, the flyleaf of the Foreman Workman uh, manuscript, and I particularly wanted you uh, to see it because the Herald uh, painter uh, who signs the uh, March 1572 matriculation uh, is Joseph Stacy, and this is the absolute proof that the book uh, fr in from which I've shown you folio 102 was in the possession of Joseph Stacy at the very time that Joseph Stacy was the Herald painter when Clooney applied for those for those um, arms, and uh, I want to show you this this page because. Uh, According to Innes of Lierney, uh, the controversy was completely settled on the 10th of September by the Lord Lyon deciding that Mackintosh was the chief of uh, Clan Chatton, which comprehended the Macphersons, and that Duncan Macpherson of Clooney was but a cadet of the family of Mackintosh. And I want to show you this, this photograph, it comes from the, the, the glimpses. Uh, and uh, each page is quite, is quite important. On the left, that, that fine photograph of the famous Ewan McPherson of Clooney, the great Victorian uh, chief of the, of the clan, and he signs himself Clooney, which is illegal uh, <laughs> because of the Act of, 15, of 1672, because one of the terms of the Act is, it is only allowed for noblemen and bishops to subscribe by their titles. All others shall subscribe their Christian names or the initial letter thereof with their surnames, and may, if they please, adject the designations of their lands prefixing the word of to the said desig designations. So that's the first uh, thing I called attention to about old, 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 old Clooney. And also look at that, the style that he always, they always used, Ewan McPherson of Clooney McPherson, chief of Clan Chatton. Uh, so, notwithstanding that Innes of Lierney tells us that it was settled in September 15, 1672 who the chief of Clan Chatton was because Lyon had made a, a, a decision and that the uh, bonds given by Clooney Macpherson after that decision had been given uh, might, if claiming to be chief of Clan Chatton, might amount to a type of treason uh, we see that the Macphersons uh, continued continued mentioning the chiefship of Clan Chatton, and those initials afterwards, CB, stand for Companion of the Bath, and Clooney uh, was favoured by the glorious condescension of the friendship of Queen Victoria. So I, I'm not sure that Queen, Queen Victoria felt that Clooney had committed any act of, of, of treason, but according to the theories of Innes of Lierne, these are really two pretty serious solecisms, heraldic armorial solecisms committed by uh, the old, the old uh, chief. Uh, here's the um, museum's photograph of the green, the green banner. Um, a wonderful photograph and uh, splendid, splendidly uh, illuminated. What's the date 
of of this um well I'll, I've, i could have a stab at the at the date at uh, the date of it the the uh, chain mcpherson's notion that this was was carried in the uh, the wars of charles the first is i think impossible it couldn't possibly be uh 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 a 17th, a mid 17th century piece of piece of painting. It looks, it looks to me much more like an early, early 18th century piece. Um, you will see that the hand is, we can say, the wrong way round, and the uh, flags uh, are blazoned as gules, um, but you will see they've been ensigned for Scotland. Uh, so that's a little curious. But let me let me show you this. Uh, that I found in uh, Henry Fraser's um, uh, funeral escutcheons in the in the lion in the lion office, and you can see his little pen and in ink drawing. Look, he puts the hand the other way round as well, and I think you can make out that his sketch of the flag uh, shows the saltire of Scotland in the top left-hand corner as well. And interestingly. Uh, the oars are in saltire, and the oars of the to the to this day the oars of the of the of the chief of Glen Chatham's arms, a blue galley on a gold background, are shown in in saltire in saltire, and um, Nisbet, whose book I've already called to your attention, mentions that the Macdonalds, the Macleans, the McNeils show galleys with arms in saltire. And so too, he says, do the, is it with the Macphersons? So uh, the idea that, in fact, the oars of Macpherson were always in the water uh, and in action um, doesn't, doesn't really um, obtain. Here's at least a drawing of 175 or earlier, uh, because that's the funeral hatchment of Sir Aeneas Macpherson of Inverishi. And amazingly enough, uh, it's not the Inverishi arms that we know from the 1672 registration, matriculation by his brother, which are of the Clooney arms within a, a, a board your gules, a red, a red border. You can see that this version of the Macpherson of Inverishi arms, uh, it's not parted per fess, it's parted per chevron. So a really fascinating uh, uh, drawing. I was I was amazed. I, and my eyes popped when I when I saw it in the in the lion in the lion office. But I must make haste to go through these slides. I was telling you. I, I, I'll give you. I'll give you my my opinion on who who painted the green the green banner. I suspect it might be the work of Richard Waite. Uh, here's a piece, a heraldic piece of Richard Waite's um, work. You can see the the very typical early 18th century mantling. It's amazing, it's amazing, sort of monstrous amount of, of mantling over the over the helmet. Um, and I think it's it's um it's consistent with the, the painting of on the banner, although it's much it's much fancier. Um, we know that Richard Waite was uh, painted portraits for the uh, the grants of grant for the um, the Rose family of, of Kil, Kilroch. And there's also the portrait of Andrew Macpherson of Cluny, uh, attributed to Richard Waite, um, believed to be a portrait painted posthumously of, of Cluny wearing his wearing tartan, tartan trues. So I, I think it's consistent with uh, Waite. And uh, if you look at the uh, green banner, look at where the hands of the two supporters are. Look at, look at where they are. They're actually on the shield. Those arms must drag on the ground. They're, in fact, they're, their arms may be about um, six feet long. And intriguingly, there was a super e exhibition of the, the, the work of Richard Waite picture drawer uh, and, uh, in, in Granton. And there's even a page about his, his funny errors in perspective. There's a portrait of a, a minister with an unbelievably long index uh, finger. So that's that's my little my little fun uh, in suggesting that it might be an early twentieth uh, century, uh, early eighteenth century piece of painting. And here is Lord Lyon 
Alexander Brody of Brody, poorly photographed by me when I was in the Lord Lyon's uh, study at the Lyon, Lyon office. Uh, Lord Lyon Brody of Brody was a staunch Hanoverian, always attended uh, the Duke of Cumberland whilst the Lord Lyon was in full tabard and uniform. And I think of, uh, I think of uh, him looking across uh, at the, uh, during the, uh, the 1745, if he saw that the Clooney's regiment uh, had appeared on the field uh, under that banner, looking ahead with a telescope and being enraged, not just that uh, uh, Clooney was on the other side of politics by him, but he was, he, Clooney, was committing the outrage of uh, showing supporters on uh, the, supporters on the uh, shield when uh, the Lord Lion, King of Arms himself, had expressly matriculated Clooney's arms anew in November 1672, the same shield, the same uh, crest, the same motto as he got in March 1672, but with no supporters, no supporters. And um, uh, I want to mention uh, uh, just that, yes, that the he uh, sent a, a letter that was to be delivered by Macintosh to uh, Macpherson. Uh, Macintosh did also procure from the Lord Lyon a letter directed to Clooney containing the words following. Sir, I gave you a coat of arms, this is in November 1672, as a cadet of Macintosh's family, and yet you have, upon pretext of that, given yourself out for chief of the Macphersons, as we are informed, and have used supporters without any warrant giving yourself in the banner the designation and of chief of Old Tanchatton. This is neither fair nor just. Therefore, you will be pleased not to abuse any favor I gave you beyond his intention, who is your very humble servant. And that was signed by Sir Charles uh, Erskine of Cambo, uh, a predecessor of Alexander Brody of Brody. And so we, we honor the name of Brody as being the middle name of our current, our current Clooney. But Alexander Brody of Brody can't have been much of a friend to the uh, Macphersons uh, at that time. Um, uh, whilst I'm looking at portraits of Lord Lyons, this is John Hook Campbell or Campbell Hook of Bankston, who was the Lord Lyon from 1754 to 1795. And uh, goodness, uh, the reason why I wanted to mention him is uh, because of the significance, the lasting significance of Duncan McPherson of Clooney's decision to get a matriculation as the only representative, true representative of the old clan Chatton. And the consequences of Duncan's decision to seek that recognition by the Lord Lyon in March uh, 1672. Um, the, the consequences are quite are quite quite great. The uh, manuscript that I that I found at Ballon at uh, mentions uh, some mistakes that uh, Sir Aeneas McPherson makes. He says that there was a statute. Uh, in force, which required uh, gentlemen and chief to, chiefs of clans to obey a requirement to uh, uh, ask for matriculation of their arms, and that therefore Clooney applied in March 1672 to the Lord Lyon. But you who have been paying attention will know that the 1672 Act was passed on the 10th of September. So what was the law that Sir Aeneas McPherson supposes that Duncan McPherson of Clooney was obeying? And he tells us it was a, it was a law from the first, the first parliament of King Charles II, and it's talking about 1561, 1562. There was indeed a Lord Lyon Act in 1662, which would have indeed required uh, gentlemen to send to the Lord Lyon uh, a description of the arms that they were using and their justification for using those arms. But that statute was rescinded in 1663. 
So there wasn't a statute in place requiring gentlemen to forward to the Lord Lion examples of the armorial bearings they were accustomed to use. Oh, the 1592 statute talks about the Lord Lion to have the right of visitation throughout Scotland, but Scotland being a, a small but a, a difficult country to travel around, the visitations didn't, didn't really take place by the uh, Lion and the officers of arms. So I stress, Duncan Macpherson of Cluny, of his own volition, decided to seek matriculation of the ancient arms of Van Chatten, arms that would have been recognized as the ancient shield of Van Chatten from that book that I showed you, Clan Chatten of Old. So it was definitely a decision. And he came very much unstuck because uh, he didn't really get the Clan Macpherson recognized as an honorable community. He got the Clan Chatten recognized as an honorable community. Uh, but he lost the right to present himself as the representative the chief of Clanchatton um, uh, between March and September uh, 1672. And he was given, amazingly enough, exactly the same shield, which of old was uh, Clanchatton's, chief of Clanchatton's shield, but as a cadet of Macintosh. And let's, let's consider what clan chiefs generally want to do. They want to be succeeded by their heirs. And usually that is by their, next, their nearest kin. And uh, what happened to Duncan McPherson of Cluny? He was succeeded by his cousin, quite distant, uh, Lachlan McPherson of Newt. Uh, Duncan McPherson of Cluny had an only daughter. Uh, she was Anne Macpherson of Cluny, and she married uh, Archibald Campbell uh, of Clunas, the younger son of Campbell of Codder. And at the time of the wedding, 1689, the uh, gentleemen of Clan Chatton, of not Clan Chatton, of Clan Macpherson, Clan Macpherson wrote to Cluny saying that they would not uh, accept him settling the chiefship on a stranger um, because they anticipated he aimed to have his son-in-law become the chief. Now, if you make your way through Innes of Leone's uh, learned, learned and very, very strongly opinionated uh, work, you will, you will see that um, old Scots peerages descend through uh, female heirs heirs of line, not just heir, heir males, it's only when the patent says it needs to go to the heir male that peerages in Scotland uh, descend through men only. Uh, and in terms of a clan, uh, Innocent Birney says that the Salic law giving emphasis to the male line is a feature of Irish procedure, uh, but in Scotland, um, from the Pictish, Pictish tradition, um, inheritance has passed through women and there's never been the operation of the Salic law in Scotland. Now, if you start reading about the Salic law, you'll find that even the Salic law back in the sixth century um, allowed for the fact that if a woman had no brother, then the inheritance could pass through her to her uh, husband or to her son. So by so many uh, proofs of uh, custom and usage, uh, the chiefship of Clan Macpherson would have been expected to descend through the line of Duncan Macpherson of Cluny, and yet he was the last of his. He was the last of his line, and um, uh, the reason uh, Innes of Leone suggests is uh, not because uh, of the importance of having a man, but because his daughter had married a Campbell and a uh, Campbell who was much in favor with the uh, Duke of Argyll and he was the sheriff of the county. And they feared that the fate of the Calders would be visited upon them at first, since namely it would be a family that would disappear uh, under the name of Campbell. Uh, and uh, they swore their great oath that they wouldn't accept this uh, Campbell, Campbell son-in-law. Son and um, uh, however, it came to pass 1699 that they did accept that Pliny Duncan could
could settle the chiefship on his grandson, Duncan, Duncan Campbell, younger of, uh, younger of Clunas. Uh, but that's not what happened, did it? In 1722, it was Lachlan of Nude, uh, and this is the family from which all the, all the uh, chiefs of Clan McPherson have descended since 1722. Uh, and I just, just think, well, um, firstly, I'm showing you the picture of John Hook Campbell of Bankston, who was Duncan Campbell of Clunas's first cousin, once removed. Very close relation of uh, the person that the McPhersons had said they would accept uh, as Clooney's heir in the event of Duncan McPherson dying without um, uh, a son, and his baby son died, died uh, in infancy. Um, so there was an acceptance by the uh, McPherson uh, gentleman that they would accept uh, Duncan of Campbell, but it didn't, it didn't come to pass. I wonder why. Why did he not become the chief in 1722? Well, uh, you might suppose that the Campbells would be staunch Hanoverians, but his grandfather, Hugh Campbell of Corder, instructed his grandson, the gallant uh, Duncan Campbell, uh, to bring out the men of Corder uh, for uh, James the Eighth during the uh, 1715 uh, rising. And so Duncan Campbell, the grandson of Duncan, Duncan of Clooney, found himself in exile. Um, he had a daughter born in 1724, I read, and she was born in Rome. So he was out of Scotland, and perhaps that, that explains why he wasn't there and in a, in a position to see if he could have inherited the uh, chiefship of Clan Macpherson and the title, the title of Clooney. Um, at this point, his father uh, was clearly not going to inherit Codder. There was no question of a Campbell uh, being both Campbell of Codder and uh, uh, also seeking to be Campbell of Campbell of, of, of Clooney. That had all been that had all been uh, settled. And the reason I, I mention Duncan is well, uh, he had a daughter. He had a daughter, Elizabeth Campbell, the heir of line of Duncan of Clooney. And we always think with uh, well. Uh, with fondness or with relief that the Macphersons missed Culloden. They were not at Culloden, but the tradition is that Elizabeth Campbell, uh, great-granddaughter of Duncan of Clooney, was on the field of Culloden um, because she was uh, betrothed to gallant Alexander McGillivray of Dunmagask, uh, and she urged him to take leadership of the Clanchatton Macintosh regiment at Culloden, and he did lead the regiment, and he was killed on the field. And it said their last parting was on the field at Culloden. So there's a little bit of a little bit of um, romance. She died uh, that same year of 1746. Um, she had no children. That was the end of that line, except. Um, Alexander Campbell of Clunas and Anne McPherson of Clooney, they had 10 children. So uh, Duncan, Duncan of Clooney had 10 grandchildren, none, none of whom succeeded to the chiefship of McPherson. And to cut to the chase, I think it's much to do with the fact that the dignity that Clooney stood upon in terms of the controversy was that he was the heir male of Clanchatton the unbroken male line, and therefore uh, to, have, uh, to have the uh, chiefship passing through a woman uh, removed what was the, the, special, the special feature of the Macpherson's claim to chiefship of, of Clanchatton. And therefore, whereas Innes of Lierney makes out that it was completely settled in September 1672, that Macintosh was the chief, I think we can't really believe that because um, why did Sir Aeneas write his memorial to Duncan McPherson of Clooney from London in July 1701? It was because Macintosh was 
uh, making, making blandishments and offers, asking Duncan of Clooney to concede that Macintosh was the chief of Clan Chatton, and Macintosh offering to take the name of Clan Chatton, which uh, 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 Innes of Learney points out was an obvious reason why uh, uh, Lyon uh, Erskine of Cambo didn't find for Macpherson because neither Macpherson nor Macintosh bore the name Chatton. And so it was the eldest line of, of the blood that um, Lyon in 1672 followed. But there we are, 1701, we've clear evidence that Macintosh was thinking of taking the name of Chatton, trying to get uh, Duncan of Cluny to give up what um, uh, Sir Ines thought had been the decision of the Privy Council that Macpherson uh, had proved uh, that he was not dependent on Macintosh and that they were two separate, separate clans. So between Macintosh's and Macpherson's, we've had completely different ideas of what was the outcome of the great controversy of 1672, particularly in relation to what went on in the Privy, the Privy, the Privy uh, Council. Um, I haven't time to read you more about what went on in the Privy Council. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's stirring, stirring, stirring stuff. Um, and also, um, of course, why was it important uh, uh, or seen as significant that Lachlan Macpherson of Nude, who became of Cluny in 1722, promptly relinquished his claim to the chiefship of Clan Chatton, acknowledging himself a cadet of Macintosh. He was, after all, the grandson of the great Macintosh historian Lachlan Macpherson of, not Lachlan Macpherson, Lachlan Macintosh of Kinrara. Um, I hasten to say, however, that with the, the band of the Macphersons, the Camerons, and the Frasers in 1742, Lachlan saw the error he had made and retracted his relinquishment of the claim of Macpherson of Clooney to the chiefship of uh, Clan, Clan Chatton. Um, but I must hasten on. I've told you about the shield, particularly about the shield of Cluny. I've mentioned the uh, supporters, but I haven't shown you the illustrations of those two uh, fighting Highland men with their targets, their targes, uh, their daggers, um, and um, uh, Alexander Macpherson in glimpses tells us that these were two two fighters from the battle, the Battle of the Shirts. Um, he puts the wrong date, but that's 1544. I don't know whether I really accept that, whether the Battle of the Shirts, that was fought in uh, Lock Harbor in very hot weather. And if it was in very hot weather and they stripped off down to their shirts, why did they keep their jackets on in the green banner? Uh, surely they'd have taken their jackets off if it was really so hot. I really rather think it was a bit of play on the uh, the Battle of the North Inch, going back to 1396. Uh, uh, I think it's um, uh, because certainly from the early 16th century, uh, Clan Chatton uh, was written of as being one of the clans at Perth. And the reason for that, it's rather, it's rather hilarious. It was a misprint. It was a misprint. Boise's um, uh, book, uh, and of 1525, uh, put a change clan quail, Q U H E L E, it put a stroke through the L and made it a T. And John Bellenden, who produced a, a translation that was published in Edinburgh, 1536, I think is the date, 1536, having seen uh, the T, uh, doubled the T and made it fun. Quatten, Clan Quatten. And that's how we ended up having people really supposing that the Chattons were one of the, uh, the clans. And of course, uh, Sir Walter so helpfully even puts a footnote mentioning Clooney McPherson being the proprietor of the, uh, the Black Chanter, which, uh, which fell from heaven on that occasion. So it's all sewn up, you see, that it was Clan Chatton and that Clan Chatton actually represented the Macphersons, uh, but it's from a misprint. <laughs> well, there, there we are. So I've mentioned the, um, uh, the shield, the crest of Clan, uh, of members of uh, Clan Chatton and of, within it, Clan Macpherson, the cat. It's a play on the word Chatton, 
it sounds like a cat. It's a play on a cat. That's that. That's why the supporters. Um, I've said I think it's rather it's a playful allusion to the battle of 1396. Um, and why did the Lord Lion deprive Cluny of his supporters? Uh, and why wasn't it until 13? I beg your pardon. Until 1873, that Lord Lion, Br uh, Lord Lion Burnet restored to Cluny the dignity of uh, lawful possession of supporters as a clan chief. Well, the reason really is, I think, because the king wrote to the Lord Lion. We don't know the exact date of the letter, but it was around about 1672 or 1673, telling Lion not to grant supporters in future to anyone under the rank of a peer. So I think it's much more likely that that letter from the king was in 1672, followed on from the passing of the, or the progress through parliament of the Lord Lyon Act. And I think that's why Lord Lyon, Charles Erskine of Cambo didn't give Clooney supporters. That's, that's my, my humble opinion on the matter. Well, in so saying, uh, I, it is my humble opinion, but I, it stands on the very sound authority of uh, John Horne's, Horne Stevenson's heraldry in Scotland, who was the first to advance the theory that I've just that I've just mentioned. And now let's talk a little bit about mottos. <clears throat> well, we we all know what Clooney's motto is. Um, this is a motto I don't think you really will have, will have seen before. You can recognise that as a McPherson shield. Um, Self-assumed arms by the famous Bishop James Gillis, the Vicar Apostolic uh, of Edinburgh, of Eastern uh, Division of the Roman Catholic Church in Scotland. Um, he became Vic Vicar Apostolic in, uh, uh, in uh, 1852. He doesn't have a crest because he is a clergyman, but look at his motto, a very, very playful uh, one, Scio qui servio. Scio qui servio. I know whom I serve. I know whom I serve. And if you, if, if you know that's the Latin and you know the Gallic for the name Gillis, you'll know that Gillis means the servant of Jesus. And so that motto is a very uh, uh, bishopy pun on the name of Gillis. Uh, and um, I'll show you my uh, motto, divorce not the cat. Uh, it's actually a motto I, I chose myself in these arms for my grandfather in 1985, divorce not uh, the, 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 the cat. Divorcement of messengers at arms is a, oh, a, a heinous crime of presenting, pre preventing an officer of the law from executing his, his, um, his duty, um, but it's also it's also a word uh, which means to deprive wrongfully or forcibly of rightful property, to eject from possession by force. And in both, in both those uh, terms, I suppose, I chose it as a bit of a pun from that um, amazing passage in the volume by the Scottish History Society published in 1902, uh, the loyal dissuasive, but this is from the piece, the patron turned persecutor, where Sir Adeus Macpherson of Inverishi uh, heroically divorces the uh, Duke of uh, Gordon's uh, Bailey. And it really is, it is um, heroic stuff. The Bailey uh, turns up with the intention of uh, destroying a third of the houses within the parish because there's a dispute over part of the estate of Inverishi uh, claimed by uh, the uh, Duke. The Bailey turns up with an army of uh, six or 700 uh, people. Uh, we discover that they're mostly Macphersons uh, to knock down Inverishi's houses. And uh, this is what it, it says, uh, Sir Ineus writes. Upon which I immediately horsed and coming to the place a little before the bailey, I dispersed my friends who had come from all the corners of the country to join me. And as the bailey gave orders to his officers to execute his sentence, I stepped betwixt him and the houses with my small retinue. 
just 12 men, with our guns bent, and told the bailiff that though I was not at the head of an army as he was, ere one sod or divot of any house there should be touched or pulled down, I and my 12 men should be ready to be buried under it. And it was 10 to 1, but he and as many of his greater numbers might come to bear me company. It was his business, I told him, to furnish officers to my lord, and if he had none, twas his indispensable duty and to act their part himself. All I desired was that he might advance but one step further, and I swore a great oath. If I could, he should never step more. And this is the occasion, you can read it in the Scottish History volume, The Loyal Dissuasive. Then he, the bailey, satisfied himself with the empty formality of taking instruments that I had to force him and his officers, to which I made answer by another instrument that I was invaded in my property by force of arms without and against all law, and that the law and nature of law of, of nature and of nations allowed me to defend myself. So there's the, um, the, the pun, the pun on the, the word uh, de force. Um, well, um, it's high time I finish because that's, that's, that's 8.30 and I've exhausted you by talking by talking, talking so, so, so long. Uh, to revive you, I'll just, uh, I'll just wave the magic, the magic of the wand of a messenger at arms. And yes, in this, the age of Harry Potter, my little daughter, uh, sole daughter of my house and heart, was very impressed growing up that her daddy had a, had, had a, had a wand. And we all know what Clooney's motto is, touch not the cat, but a glove, a fine motto to which we can all uh, pledge allegiance and rather playfully say in ending, touche. Well, thank you, Roderick. That was an excellent, excellent uh, address to this group of, of interested participants. Um, I know we have a, a couple of questions, most from, uh, from one uh, participant in particular. We may not have time to get to them today, unfortunately, but I I think if it's not um, objectionable to you, I will forward those questions along and perhaps you can have a dialogue with, uh, with Kenneth about some of the questions that he had, uh, had uh, listed in the chat here. Um, we do have uh, another word uh, from our own historian at the museum, Ewan McPherson of Talashi, um, and he uh, wants to send along his best wishes to your father, the Reverend Gordon McPherson. Um, this Thank was, uh, you, Ewan. How kind of you. Uh, Ewan, too, recently uh, published his, his own book, The Trials, Triumphs, and Treasures of the Clan McPherson. Much of your, your conversation with us today, um, I, I recall from having uh, read and, and proofread uh, Ewan's book earlier uh, this summer. So um, truly wonderful, a, a lot for us to think about uh, and to marinate upon. Um, but this was this was truly an, an excellent, excellent presentation, and we're very grateful to to have you here today. I will uh, again, if it's of no objection to you, I'll pass along your email to uh, the interested parties, and and perhaps some of those questions could be answered in an offline format. Thank, thank you, Bo, and and a, a big thank you to everyone who has asked questions. And uh, excuse me for having obtruded myself upon your screens and uh, microphones for the, for the whole time until, until uh, half past eight. It just goes to show, my goodness, uh, 1672, once you wind a McPherson <laughs> up and you get him talking about it, uh, drawing, drawing him back in and to a conclusion is uh, difficult. <laughs> we, were, we were delightful to have had the opportunity to speak with you today. So thank you so much to everyone who joined us. Thank you again. Have a, a wonderful evening or afternoon, wherever you might be. Uh, the next um, event will be upcoming in um, October. Please keep an eye on social media and on your email for invitations uh, through Eventbrite. Um, a lovely evening to you all, and, and we'll speak soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you.